Well, who was here last night? How was it? Did you enjoy yourself? There's something about the presence of the Lord that is so sweet. And, and thank you, Rana, for coming. And thank you, Jerry, for coming. And, uh, and just open up your hearts today and receive what God wants you to, to be imparted in your life. Paul says, I long to be with you that I may impart a spiritual gift. That's, that was Paul's heart. And today, Rana's going to be imparting spiritual gifts. But you have to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Jesus said that the words that I speak are spirit in their life. And therefore, he says, you're created in my image and likeness. You will be speaking spirit and life. And so Rana is going to be speaking spirit and life. And if you have ears to hear what the spirit is saying, you'll be changed. And so it's important that you connect with God on your own so that your spirit is learning how to hear spirit. Am I making sense? I hope I'm making sense. Because... You can say the same sentence in the Spirit of God and it's going to bring life or the same sentence and nothing happens. It all depends with your heart connection with God. And one thing I know about Rana is her heart is connected to God. Completely connected. And so we're just so thrilled that you're here today, Rana. Um, before Rana comes up, we're going to take uh, tithes and offerings. And so if you need an envelope, put up your hand and we'll get an envelope to you. And whatever you put on the envelope, Mark Rana will go directly to her ministry, which, uh, if you were here last night, is quite intense. <laughs> <laughs> she has a, an anointing, a call to win people who are not just on the street, but especially prostitutes for some reason. Just, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds. I know over that one year it was over 800 and some. And then it continues to go on, even when she's not really looking for it, the call finds her. And that's something that, that you can learn vicariously, is the call that's on your life is going to open up doors of opportunity. The gifts will make room for your calling. Amen? And so really hear what, what the Spirit is saying through Rana today, because it will transform you. And as you get transformed, our city will be transformed. <laughs> Amen? And so, Father, I thank you that you have given us the ability to give. And today, Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you're pouring into people's lives. The financial blessings that you pour in people's lives. And God, we thank you that you provide every need according to your riches. Amen? Amen. So when you're ready, you can just come and bring your offering to the Lord. And there's a machine at the back, a debit machine. If you run out of $100 bills, you can just go back there. <laughs> I want to share a testimony that I shared last night that uh, Francisco had told me. And it's a ministry uh, uh, through Bobby Connor. And, and uh, one of the... He was, he was at a meeting... And I say this because I want to encourage you to, to know the authority that God's given you in your life. He was at a meeting with a man from Asia, and in Asia they were having this service, and there was 300,000 people there? Thank you. 300,000 people at this meeting, and this, this man stands up, and I don't know his name, he stands up and he says, just to, to show you that we've been given the same authority that Jesus has, at the count of three, I'm going to, um, every demon in this place is going to manifest. And so he goes, one two, three, and, and the whole place broke out in a, manifest, a demonic manifestation. And then he says, now to show you that, I have the, that, that we have the same authority that Jesus has, I'm going to count to three and every demon's going to leave. And he goes, one, two, three, and every demon left the place. And then glory broke out. Amen? And then he says that this place, um, I believe it was in North Western Church, in this Western Church, he, he says, now there's some of you here who don't believe me. And he says, just to show you that, I, that we have the same authority that Jesus has, at the count of three, everybody's clock is going to stop, including your phones. And he goes, one, two, three, and everybody's clock stop. Watches, phones, clocks on the wall, everything just stopped dead. And he says, to show you that we have the same authority that Jesus has, at the count of three, every clock's going to catch back up to where it should be. One, two, three, and it caught up. 
okay? I say this because this is what we've been talking about, the dominion of God that he's given us, the eighth-day church, if you will. The eighth-day church is a church that walks in the dominion of God. And I say this to encourage you because Ron is going to come and equip you to walk more into what God's called you to do, which is have dominion over everything. <laughs> Go and subdue and make it look like heaven. Because Jesus' prayer was that earth should look like heaven. I know many people are waiting for earth to look like hell so Jesus can come back, but that just doesn't work for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to come and rescue my bride out of hell, all smoky, and, and that's just not, that's not gospel. The gospel is that every day his kingdom advances. Every day the government has an increase the government of God has an increase, and we should be expecting more and more glory to break out and more and more good things to happen and more evil to be pushed down so that when the Lord comes back, he's coming back for a spotless church. Amen? Now, there's one more thing that I have to say before we, before we go on, and then it's my wife's birthday. Oh! <laughs> Can you stand up? Come on up here, honey. She just, yeah, I'll pay later, but that's okay. <laughs> Isn't she amazing? Yeah. Now, you have a mission today, and that's um, whoever, whoever can, during or after the service or whatever, probably after the service, just come and speak a blessing over her life. Amen? <laughs> Happy birthday, honey. 32, right? <laughs> There, now I'm safe later. Hallelujah. So has everybody had an opportunity to give? Next weekend, um, the men are going to be going to uh, Englishman River Falls camping. And there's a few spots left for any, any, anyone who's interested. It's a pretty, uh, we've got four campsites done. There's room for like 16 men. So there's a couple, couple places left. If you're interested, see Chris. Uh, wave Chris. That's the guy you see. 60 bucks for camp, and that includes your food. It's a pretty good deal, uh, unless you want to bring your own schmores or whatever. And so next weekend, um, we'll be away camping. And Jenny, where's Jenny? Jenny's going to be the preacher. Bless you, Jenny. <laughs> Hallelujah. So have fun next weekend. But right now, could we just stand as we honor Rana as she comes up? This is an amazing woman of God. <clears throat> Been to over 120 nations. <laughs> seen countless miracles, thousands saved, and we're so grateful to have you here. Praise God. I'm glad to be back. Father, put your hands out towards her. Father, thank you for our friend, and thank you for your friend coming here. Lord, we bless her today, and we receive everything that she has to, to impart to us today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise bless God. Her. Praise God. At the end, will I go to pray for people? If you can go back by the CDs. Can you do that? I know you don't like to, but thanks. Praise God. Just want to explain. My friend back here is not being rude by packing up now, but when we finish, we have got to run <laughs> to the ferry because <laughs> we have a meeting tonight over in uh, North Delta. So we've got to get it down to the ferry as soon as we leave. So he's packing up now. And then when he finishes packing up, while I'm praying for some people before we take off, he's going to go back to the CD table. So we're covering sort of every base that we can in the time that we have. So please forgive him. He's not trying to be rude. He's just trying to make, make it so we can give you as much time as possible. Amen? So he, he does have a, several different copies of his CD back there. The newest one, that song that he just did, More Like You or More Like Him, it's the title song of his newest, or one of the two newest albums that he has. He's got two new English ones, and he's got a Spanish one that are new since we were here last. And the Spanish one is under the same title, Mas Como Tu. And so if you get one of his CDs, we have a special deal for you today. For as many as are left, there's a couple of Brian Dirksen and Andy Park CDs back there. So if you give a donation for one of Jerry's CDs, they go into the production of more 
CDs. You know, they're not, it's not just used for anything. The money from the CDs goes straight back into producing more. So if you give a donation, because a, su a suggested donation of $10 or more for one of the CDs, which is a cheap price for a CD, you know, uh, you can take one of Brian's or Andy's CDs for, as a free gift. Okay? But um, once the Andy's and Brian's run out, they're out. I don't have any more of them. I had a few copies of his books left, but they're in Spanish, so... If you speak Spanish, see Francisco. He'll help you with one of those. But I'd promise them to his dad. Um, I'd promise them to his dad, and since nobody here really speaks Spanish, I don't think, other than them. Oh, there's a lady back there that speaks Spanish. Can you make sure she gets one of them? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Jerry will be back there at the CD table at the end. He's not usually there pushing his wares, you know, <laughs> but it's just the time factor today, so I hope it still works out. Anyhow, I really am glad to be back here with you. It's been a while, but those of you that were here last night, you know, um, we were supposed to actually come last year, but I had a major stroke, and I couldn't walk, and I couldn't talk, and I couldn't see, and I couldn't read, and all this kind of stuff, but then two months later, I took off to preach in India. <laughs> <laughs> So for someone that's not supposed to do anything, you know, yeah, I'm supposed to still be in physiotherapy right now to be, learn how to walk again. And there's a program in Surrey, in northern Vancouver, it's called the uh, Community Readiness Program. And if you've had a serious stroke or anything like that, you're supposed to go through this program so they can sign you off and say that you're safe and ready to be back in the community. Except every time they tried to put me into that program, They'd phone me up and they'd say, oh, we've got a space here. Oh, well, I'm going to be in Colombia on that day. Oh, we got a space. Oh, I'm going to be off in Uruguay that day. We've got a space here. Oh, I'm going to be in India. And they were getting so frustrated because every time they phoned, I was either out of the country or heading out of the country. And finally she phoned and she says, you don't really need us, do you? <laughs> no, I've been trying to tell you that. Well, you know, we're supposed to sign off that we know you can do these things. Well, come on. I've been doing all these flights all over the world, been standing and preaching all over the world, and you're wait, waiting for me to sign off on this program. She, finally, she said, I'm just going to sign you off. <laughs> so I'm free. <laughs> but I don't look like I just had a strike less than a year ago, do I? A stroke? No, I don't think so. But anyhow, God knows and... Um, he also knows he's still got things for me, so I'm still st stuck here. <laughs> Praise God. But I want to look at a passage this morning. It's a passage. You need brakes on this thing. It takes off. You know, I lean and it just takes off on me. But it, how many of you know the story of Esther? You know, she, she ends up in the palace right when they're wanting to take out her people. And it said in Esther chapter 4, verses 8 through 17, it says, He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might, draw, might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And then es Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So then Mordecai told, told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do you not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, 
night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So, are you here for such a time as this? Are you here for such a time as this? You know, the, I know you've received a lot of words and there's been things coming from people all over the place. There's some special things that are coming here to Nanaimo. Some special things that are coming to here, to the, here to this island. Will it be easy? Probably not. Will there be obstacles along the way? You can be guaranteed it. That's one thing I know you can be guaranteed. That when you step forward for God, the enemy is going to come in and try and hold you back in any way that he can. He'll try whatever he can do to stop you. But it's up to you to step forth in faith, in obedience, like we talked about last night. Stepping forward in obedience. That you can say, okay, God, this really doesn't look very uh, easy to do. But nevertheless, at your word, I will. For those of you that were here last night, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. So here we've got Esther. You know, okay, God, this is really not the way to go. But nevertheless, at your word, I will. Nevertheless, at your word, I will. If I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. And personally, I can say, if I die doing what God's asked of me, I'd rather that than be stuck out of fear, out of unbelief, out of doubt. Are you always going to be popular? <laughs> I'm sure Wayne can answer that one. <laughs> Is it all, are you always going to be popular, Wayne? Absolutely not. <laughs> Will people maybe speak against you? Yeah. Will you be the one that is in just the good books of everybody? I don't think so. Been there, done that too many times. Had too many people not like me because of steps that I've taken. But you know what? I'd rather that than be disobedient to what God is asking. I'd far rather that than be disobedient to whatever it is that God's asking. It's the same for each one of us. You have a choice to be obedient to God or to be disobedient. Choices in our hands. But God is expecting, believing, trusting that we're going to be obedient to whatever it is he asks. I shared a little bit last night about the, this new batch of prostitutes that have been put in our hands. When Jerry was doing the music at the street church in Vancouver, right down at Maine and Hastings, all of a sudden these girls come in off the streets that you knew weren't your regular, homeless, heroin addict prostitute. You knew that. But why they would come into that place, who knew, knows at that time? except they heard Jerry's music and the spirit that was just so drawing that they came in off the street to listen to the music. They didn't come in for the free Christmas dinner that we were offering or the Christmas gifts. They, didn't, they weren't even interested in it. They wanted to hear the music. So, you know, it looks like God had us there for such a time as this. And out of that, there were seven girls that came in that night and over the next few months... 34 of them have now received the Lord. Amen. It's been amazing watching what God's been doing. 34 of them. We've been able to get five, six, seven, eight of them out of the area now that are out of prostitution and in safe zones. It's been amazing just watching. But God had us there that night. Yes, we were feeding the homeless. Yes, we had Christmas gifts for them. Jerry was playing beautiful Christmas music. But I believe that God had us there for such a time as this. That those girls just, just happened to be walking down the street in front of the building. And the window opened enough in the freezing cold, because that was a very cold day, 
in Vancouver that they could hear the music and be drawn in because of it. It's not a place that normally somebody would be just drawn into, except God orchestrated the whole thing. Jerry had come up from Mexico to do the music for this Christmas dinner, and it wasn't like he was coming up to do a whole bunch of meetings. Pretty much it was the Christmas dinner and two other services, I think. And then he had to go back to Mexico to have Christmas with his family. So just for such a time as this, the whole thing was orchestrated. And they were just walking by, just happened to walk by an area that normally they would never be walking in. But one of the girls, she said to me later, I wanted to tell, you know, the girls down here, they don't have to be slaving these $10 tricks like this down here in the in the slums is her wording, in this horrible area, knowing, not knowing what anybody even has that they could catch. You know, there was a far better way. You know, this was her, there was a far better way. You know, this is a prostitute telling another prostitute, don't do it this way, do it this way. But they just happened to be walking that street at that moment for such a time as this. So I, for the next little while, I started meeting with them and the group grew and grew and grew. It's been amazing. But we were there for such a time as this. We were there again a week ago, uh, a week ago Friday, last Friday. And um, a guy came in, exactly the same thing. He came in. And I went to offer him a dinner. Oh, no, I don't need, need a dinner. I'm not hungry. I'm fine. But I heard the music. And he was drawn in again. It's amazing what God will use or who God will use to fulfill his for such a time as this moment. Some of you are here today for such a time as this. There's some things that God has coming for all of you, but there's some specifically that God has placed you here as a key in the for such a time as this moment for Nanaimo. There was a time we were meeting when, my, when I very first started my church in New Westminster. I ended up getting very sick. Um, actually, I was expecting and became very ill. And the baby was born early and she died after just a few hours, you know. And I was quite sick. They discovered at that time there was some problems, some issues with my blood and all sorts of stuff. So I was just out of the hospital. When I was in the hospital, I was saying, God, what do you want us to do? We were meeting in a brand new hotel. The inn at the key at that time was brand new. It had only been open a few months. And we were meeting there. It's the only place we could find. And um, I said, God, it's just not working. I know you called me to reach out to the homeless, to the addicts, etc. But they're not going to come into the hotel. They probably wouldn't get past the front door even if they tried to. What do you want us to do? And God very, very specifically spoke, I want you to go and meet in the park where they congregate, was the word. They lived under the trees, et cetera, et cetera, in Moody Park. That was their home. I want you to go and meet in the park, in their territory, where they will feel comfortable. So I did. Was it strange? Yes. I couldn't stand very much. I couldn't sit. I was pretty sick. And yet, that's what God said to do. So we, we would take a lounge chair and we would go over to the park and set up a volleyball net and croquet and all this kind of stuff. And there was basketball courts right there. I sat in my lounge chair with my feet up and everybody else was going and inviting people in the park to come and play volleyball or whatever. And then we said, you know, after the volleyball game, we're going to be serving dinner whether it's hot dogs or sandwiches or soup or stew or what. We couldn't do too much in the park. And nor could we say we were having a service. The, the police said, you can tell them you're having a sing-along or something like that, but you can't tell them you're having a church service. That's not allowed. So we put out an ad that we were having a sing-along in Moody Park at such and such a time. And these people came out for a sing-along. <laughs> but then we served the dinner, we served the food, and over the two months, you know, this is Vancouver, okay? It, it rains 365 days of the year. <laughs> but you know, if you look up that summer, there's not one day that we got rained out. Because I'm saying, but God, you know it's going to rain. We're going to be in trouble. 
And I said, we don't have the money to rent a big tent. He said, I didn't ask you to rent a big tent. <laughs> oh, that's good because we don't have the money to do it even if you did. But um, there was one Sunday morning that summer that it rained in the morning. But by the time we got there, because we set up at 2 in the afternoon, by the time we got there, everything was dry. Everything it was perfect. So then we'd start our, we'd start, have our volleyball and all that kind of stuff. And then we'd start our um, food, serving whatever we had that day. And then we'd start our service. People would sit on a blanket or whatever. I sat in my lounge chair. Not to be the princess, but that's all I could do. I couldn't have gotten down to the ground and gotten back up if I tried. I was so sick. But, um, and then, you know, I'm not one. I don't like a lot of people walking out in the middle of my service. Back then, I used to get really, now I couldn't care less, but I used to get really upset about it. And I'm sitting there, and there was music was going on, and then I was going to share a, a brief message. And I said to my assistant, if I'm not back, you take over. And the Lord told me to get up and go to the bathroom. But God, you know I don't like doing that in the middle of a service, you know. But I got up and I went for such a time as this. I walked in the bathroom just as a young girl was walking out of the stall. And God said, tell her to throw those pills away. Tell her not to do it. And she looks at me. So I told her. She looks at me as if I'm crazy. And I said, throw those red pills away, because then God told me the color. And she opened her hand. Her hand was full of these red pills. She was planning on taking her life. She had just found out she was pregnant. Fourteen years old and pregnant. And so it was for such a time as this that God had me get up, feel extremely rude, and walk out of the meeting. But, okay, God, nevertheless, it's your word. I will. You know, <laughs> I had to put it into practice, but I walked back to that bathroom, walked in, told her to throw those pills away. And uh, so she, finally she did. She knew I wasn't going to let her take them anyways. I wasn't leaving her side until she threw them away. So um, I said, what's going on? And she, she told me, she said, I just found out I'm pregnant. I said, well, that's not the end of the world. She says, well, for me it is. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, if I tell my mom and dad, for me it's the end of the world. I said, how come? Her mom and dad were both big lawyers in New Westminster. And she said, as soon as they find out I'm pregnant, they're going to want me to abort first off, which I can't do. She says, no matter what, I cannot kill my baby. And, um, and she said, and then I don't know what steps they'll take after that, but it won't be nice. So she said, will you come and talk to my parents with me? Oh. Okay, <laughs> sure, be happy to. <laughs> so... Uh, I went as she was talking to her mom. Her dad wasn't home at the moment. And then her mom instantly, as soon as she told her she was pregnant, well, we'll have to get you in for an abortion right away. And she says, I can't do that, mom. Well, we'll have to send you away to such. Mom. And then I asked, I asked the girl, I said, will you go to your room for a few minutes? I want to talk to your mom. And I said, do you know she knew exactly how you were going to respond, which is what you just did. And consequently, yesterday, rather than have to face this, she almost took her life. She had a handful of pills that when I walked into the restroom, she was right about to take. And she had it calculated. She knew how many she could take without throwing up and getting sick to her stomach. And how many she could take that would kill her, not just turn her into a vegetable. She knew exactly. She had it calculated. And she had the perfect amount of pills. And because she knew this is how you were going to respond, she was set to take her life. 
all set. So what you've done is just confirm what she was feeling. She is your daughter. Yes, she's pregnant. Yes, it might not be the best circumstances, but yes, she is pregnant. And she needs now as much if not more than ever your love and acceptance. So the mother, when the father came home, the mother told the father and they talked about sending her off to this home for unwed mothers and all this kind of stuff, you know. And then the girl said to me, she says, what about, what about my aunt? My aunt in Toronto, she loves me. She's always been my favorite aunt, and I've been her favorite niece. Could we phone her? So we phoned her, and the aunt was so excited. She said, send her back here, I'll take care of her. I'd love to have her here. This aunt, her husband and her, had been trying to have a child for I think it was nine years, if I remember correctly, and they'd never been able to conceive, ever. They were told by the doctors it wasn't going to happen. So then when they found out that Wendy was pregnant, the aunt said, look, if you'd like, because you, know, you are only 14, when the baby's born, we'll adopt her. And then social services cannot come in and take her away from you because of your age. But you could be here and still be her mother, but we'd be the official on paper, parents, if, you, if you're interested, we're willing to do that. And she said how her husband and her had talked about it, and they were more than happy and excited about it. So anyhow, they were, can you believe it? They were Christians. <laughs> so any, they talked with her, they prayed with her, they kept taking her to church every Sunday, and at other times as well. They got her into a course for young mothers, and um, the baby was born. You know, I used to like it. My name is a very unusual name, and I'd never met any in the world, anyone in the world with my name. You know, and I've been in 120 countries more, you know, and I'd never run into another Rana until all these young women who got pregnant, and I'd, or I'd either prayed for them to get pregnant or one or, you know, other situations, started calling their babies Rana. So she said, you wouldn't mind if I called the baby Rana, would you? <laughs> well, yes, I would. I like having a unique... No. <laughs> so anyways, I went back when the baby was born, got to meet Rana, little Rana, and she was so cute. But it was actually her aunt that paid my ticket back there because she said, Wendy really needs your support at this moment. It's very difficult. She really needs your support. She paid my way to go back there to be with her. But, you know, God had us meeting in a park, which was not where I wanted to be meeting, for such a time as this. And if we take steps of obedience, we have no idea maybe what that for such a time as this is or what it means. But he does. He knows exactly. He knows exactly what it signifies. There was another time in Vancouver. I was working with Bernice Gerard at the time, if any of you know who Bernice was. Well, I was working with her, and I used to book and do the pre-interviews with anybody that she was going to do a radio or television interview with. And we had booked the mayor of Vancouver. And I was on my way to his office to meet with him. And I'm I have this appointment, a specific time, set with the mayor. And the next thing you know, God says, turn around and go to the white spot. What? So anyhow, I headed to the white spot, the one that, it was at uh, King Ed and Canby. It doesn't exist anymore. I think God had it torn down to help me with the trauma I was going through because of it, you know. But <laughs> anyways, I get over there. I'm sitting having a coffee, and the next thing you know, I start overhearing a very, very private conversation. It's as if I'm sitting at this end of the restaurant, 
and where Jerry is sitting back there is about where these two girls were. And they were having a very private conversation. It wasn't one that they would be shouting out at the top of their lungs so I could hear it where I was sitting. Because the one was trying to convince the other to leave her husband and son and move in with her. Yeah. So that's not something that you expect to be hearing, you know. And I'm looking around trying to see who's talking. And that was the only place where there was two women sitting together at that moment in the restaurant. So I knew it was them talking. And as I listened and I watched, as one voice was speaking, one person's lips were moving. Then it changed to the other person, back and forth, back and forth. And I knew it was their conversation. And then they got up to come and pay their bill. And I was right near the cash register, right? And so I heard their actual voices. It was the voices that I had been hearing. So I okay, God, now what do I do? I did not want to go and confront them. It was not a conversation that I wanted to go over and rehash with them in any way, shape, or form. But I thought, okay, God, I paid my bill, went out to the parking lot, and God had mercy. They were leaving, and I couldn't have caught them. So that's fine. So they left, and I prayed for them. And I told Bernice and her partner, Velma, what I just, had just happened, and that we all prayed. And, and then I was heading to a, my next appointment with the mayor, my makeup appointment for the one I'd missed. And again, go back to the white spot. I don't like going to that white spot, God go back to the white spot. So I went back and I was sitting down and the next thing you know, one of the two girls, the one that was married and had a son, walked in. And she sat down at a table. Okay, now God, now what do I do? And I knew God was trying to get me to go over to the table. But I did not want to go over to the table. I was fighting going over to the table. So finally, I decided, okay God, nevertheless, at your word, I will. And I got up and went over to the table. I'm sure you could see my knees shaking. I was so traumatized. What am I going to say, God? To top it off, I could remember her friend's name. I could remember her son's name. But do you think I could remember her name? I don't even know if her name had been mentioned. I have no idea. But I headed over and I'm looking at her and I said, oh, How's Michelle? That was her friend's name. She says, oh, are you a friend of Michelle's? No. <laughs> well, I couldn't lie and say yes. All I could say was no. And then the only other thing I could ask, and how's Kevin? That was her son's name. Oh, I see. You know my son. No. Well, what's going on then? I said, well, do you remember when you and Michelle were sitting at that table back there? Yeah. Well, I was sitting right there. Well, so what? Well, I said, I, I know I shouldn't have been able to, but I understood, and I overheard, sorry, your entire conversation. You what? We were whispering. I said, I don't care how loud or soft you were talking. I overheard your entire situation and circumstances. I overheard what Michelle was asking of you. And I heard you tell her that you'd go home and think about it and you could meet up again. So that's fine. And then I looked at her and I said, you know, I was on my way to an appointment both times that God brought me in here when you were here. I said, I was on my way to meet with the mayor right now, and God told me to get back to the white spot. And um, I said, I believe God brought me here because he wanted to show you in a very special way how much he loves you. And those were the exact words God told me to say. And then right then, She started crying. But it wasn't a nice, soft, gentle cry. 
It's like she was wailing in the middle of the restaurant. Wah! You know, in the middle of the restaurant. And the, the table next to hers had two police officers sitting at it. <laughs> you guys are laughing. Just wait till you're in that position, okay? It wasn't very comfortable. The police officer get, comes over. He turns his back to me, ignores me. He taps her on the shoulder as she's down. Wah! And he taps her on the shoulder and he says, is this woman bothering you? I had visions of being dragged off in handcuffs as she said yes, you know. But she says, no, it's okay, I'll be okay. I said, it's okay, she's just received some rather surprising news. So he went back and sat down, but he was watching every move I made. And then Michelle walked in. I thought, I gotta get out of here. So <laughs> I gave her my phone number and I said, look, if you want to talk, feel free to give me a call. And I went back and sat down at my table. Well, Michelle came in and I got up and paid my bill and got out of there real quick. And I got a call from her so the next day or two days later. And she said, will you meet me for coffee? I said, I will meet you in any restaurant in this city. Just don't ask me to go to that white spot again. <laughs> so we met and... Um, she said, do you remember the words that you spoke to me? Why you were there? And I said, yeah. I said, God was said to tell you that he wanted to show you how much he loved you in a very special way. And she started crying again. Wasn't wailing this time though, okay? So it was safe. And um, she looked at me and she said, do you know my dad was a Pentecostal pastor. I grew up a pastor's daughter. And my dad died when I was about 13 years old. And I was so mad. I blamed God. I blamed God. I was so mad. Because I thought it was God's fault that my dad had this heart attack. I watched him as people in the church were bad-mouthing him and talking him down and slandering and gossiping. And, and I was sure that God had caused his heart attack that killed him. And I told God that day that if I was ever going to come back to him, he had to show me how much he loved me in a very special way. And that was the exact wording I had told God. He had to show me how much he loved me in a very special way. And that's the exact words that you spoke to me. Well, I want you to know, I told Michelle I could never see her again, that it was over. I mean, she had all sorts of reasonings as to why what was happening happened. She had made a special anniversary dinner and her husband didn't show up. The roast ended up burnt, the candles had burned down to nothing. And um, you know, so she had all sorts of reasonings. She went out when her husband didn't show up. She finally went out to a bar. She wasn't a bar person. She didn't realize it was a gay bar that she'd gone into. And that was where she met Michelle. But God had me in that position for such a time as this. And there's a lot of times he wants to see you in places for such a time as this. At times we said yes, at times we said no. But we need to realize if it's God's sending, it's for such a time as this. God has sent you here, some to this city, some to this church, but God has put you here for such a time as this because of all that he has ahead coming for this church and for this city. Are you willing to walk into your for such a time as this moment? Close your eyes for a minute, please. Are you willing to walk into your for such a time as this moment? 
Or are you going to say, I'm not ready for that, God. I don't want to go there, God. I don't think I belong in that place, God. That's all irrelevant. Not whether you think you can do it. Not whether you want to do it. Not whether you think you belong there. It's whether you are going to be available to God in that for such a time as this moment.